God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love. He lived for you. He lived and died. My Savior lives because He lives. I can face tomorrow because He lives. All fear is gone because.
I could have called it. He could have come down, which I did, as you know. I might have even called it, do you want a donut? But whatever the end result is, we'll all we'll try to learn from the message today and walk even closer with the Lord. There's a song that was written many, many years ago. In fact, a whole lot of songs written about this particular scripture that we'll be sharing today. This particular song, uh, the writer named it When Jesus Hung on Calvary. And you're all familiar with that story. I'm not telling you anything new at all. We know the story well enough. And we're told that people came from miles and miles around just to witness that, spe that spectacle. They wanted to see it. And they said, if you be the Christ, you come on down and save your life. But this morning I stand before you here to say, and I'm so proud to be able to say this, he could have come down, but he didn't. Ain't you glad? Yeah. yeah. You know, the story's just been told over and over and over again. How disturbing, uh, the, how distressing that whole situation would have been if you read about it. You know, the cross and the crucifixion. You know the scene. And we're told that the cross is generally recognized as a symbol for Christian religion. But you know also, utilized at one time as an instrument of death, the cross was despised by both the Jews and the Romans. What's interesting to note that I found out in my research though, is even though the Romans administered execution by crucifixion, if you were a Roman, you could not be crucified. That's an interesting fact. And we read that those victims that were subjected to such a horrible end, they were first scourged, they were beaten, they were whipped. And a lot of folks believe that was to help deaden the pain a little bit that they were going to be suffering. And it would help hasten the death. And folks, we know what happened after that. They became the nails. You've seen the pictures, you've read it in the book, the nails, right through the palm of the hands, and some of the crucifixions that went right through the wrist. Sometimes not only nails were used, but pegs of different kinds. A lot of the crucifixions involved, it seemed like uh, sometimes they put pegs in the sides even, and then finally they crossed the legs and drove that peg right into your feet to keep your nail to the cross. Just a quick time out to Bob, could we maybe get the air turned down a little bit or turned up a little bit? Or, it's kind of warm in here, don't you think? I'm sweating already and I've hardly begun. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bob. So research then tells us a lot of times that person was even given a potion to help Dead in the pain. Can you imagine such excruciating pain as to be nailed to a cross? But let's consider the possibilities, brothers and sisters. You know, any one or more of the following would you lose fever, shock, heat or exposure, hunger, thirst, pain, delirium, internal bleeding, inflamed or infected wounds, any or all of those would make crucifixion just a horrible means of death. And we read that the time for death, in these instances, the time varied. We read that some people suffered for as long as 36 hours. To me, that's just unimaginable. 36 hours on the cross. So I bet you can now imagine with me how astonished old Pilate was when they came to him and they told him that Jesus had died after only a few hours on the cross. But church, the fact that this man had done no wrong at all, the one who had the authority to raise the dead, he could go out and he could heal the sick. He could have saved himself. You know, he did not have to suffer the sins of the world. He could have come down, but he didn't. How about an amen right here? No extra charge. Hallelujah for that. That was the destiny of Jesus. And history tells us that he had the audacity to stand up and speak out against the Jewish authorities. 
and their traditions, and combined with his divine powers, he caused those that were in power to become so enraged at him, so jealous of him. And we kind of know the rest of the story. I probably don't even have to preach it this morning. Those enraged men were so filled with jealousy, and they were filled with contempt, and they condemned this man of mercy to his death. And I mentioned earlier, even though the law wouldn't permit the death of Christ in Rome, those people were so totally committed to obtaining the total and complete destruction of Jesus Christ, they took him to the governor to obtain their desired result. I read also that under cover of darkness, they, they took him and they kept rearranging their story a little bit, trying to make it fit. What they wanted to do is they wanted to get approval to obtain their unjustified result. But you know, there's an amazing thing to this story to me, and that's so amazing, that these people that went to such great lengths to procure those beans, the amazing wonder of that whole incident is that Jesus could have saved himself, but he didn't. Ain't you glad? Let's say it one more time. Ain't you glad? Yeah. Amen for that good news. We know that... Uh, Jesus was convicted of a crime that he never committed. And he was hung up there between those two thieves. You remember the story, brothers and sisters? And he bled and he died there on that cross. And that very act, that act right there, enables each and every one of us to have the opportunity to find that forgiveness. To be reconnected to our Father. To find that sweet salvation. He's calling right now. <laughs> Tell him we'll be done in another 30 or 45 minutes. Sorry. No, don't worry about it. You know, our Father recognized, folks, that we are we're out here lost in a sea of sin. We're out there in a leaking lifeboat, if you will. But our Father loved us so very, very much that He went out and He organized a rescue party to save us. He wanted to save all His children. And he sent out that rescue party in the form of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then He threw out the lifeline. And you know what that lifeline was? That was the precious blood of Jesus. That blood that was shed for you and me. And he secured our safety when he could have come down, but he didn't. Ain't you glad? Yeah. yeah. Oh, amen, brothers and sisters. Amen. And church, what does all this mean anyway? Why do we focus so much on the cross and the crucifixion? The fact that he could have come down from the cross... We've got to understand the importance in order to have that strong relationship with the Lord. Because you see, for us to understand the magnitude of the love that God has for us is overwhelming. Something that we cannot believe. Hard to fathom. Because our God is much more than a vague and distant force out there. Instead, we've got a Father out there that wants to take care of us. He wants to provide for us. He wants to protect us. He wants to assure that we have that salvation. What a great Father. But you know, in order for that crucifixion to have any justification at all, what we've got to do is we've got to be aware of the importance for a desire to strive to live holy. We know that Jesus went out and He paid the ransom note for every one of us here today. And he freed us from that kidnapper's grasp. I'm talking about old Satan himself. And we're grateful. We're grateful to a Savior who could have come down, but he didn't. And I know you're going to say, ain't you glad? I agree. And you're all familiar, I think, brothers and sisters, with those crosses. Those three crosses that are up on the mountain of the day that Jesus was crucified. On that particular day, there was going to be three people who died up there. Now what do you suppose all those crosses represent, if anything at all? I do. Do they represent guilt or shame? 
maybe in some instances, but I believe the first cross that we'll talk about could be considered the cross of rejection. You see, it held up one of those two thieves that you've read about in the Scripture. He was about to be crucified, and he would not even admit to his own guilt. Instead, he just jeered at it at our Jesus. He jeered at him and asking him why he wouldn't save himself. He wasn't there attempting to ask for forgiveness for the sins that he had committed. He wasn't even angry with himself for what he'd done wrong. He was angry because he got caught. Next to him right over there was a man who had the power to save him. And he didn't even use the power to save himself. Hmm. Christ said, that thief, he didn't understand the purpose of the cross or the crucifixion for the Christ. He doubted the ability of Jesus and he was co totally confused to think that the fact that he could have come down but he didn't was just a sign of weakness. That's the work of Satan. I believe we know his purpose. What does Satan do? Each and every day, his charge is to go out amongst each of us in all of our communities, all around the world, and he spreads hatred and disbelief and distrust and confusion and doubt. And that list don't end. It just goes on and on and on. He's out there doing his work. And since the beginning of time, unfortunately, he has just caused so many children of God to doubt the ability of God. You know, whenever you begin to focus on the factor of doubt, you'll find that Satan is on the scene. He's right there. If he's got a big old pot, I can just envision him out there stirring it up. All the trouble that he can, old Satan is doing his job, but he just thrives so much when we worry and doubt our Lord. He's the one that wrote the book. He's the author of the book on mistrust. He's the author of the book on confusion. And he enjoys it so much when we lose sight of the fact that Jesus could have come down from the cross, but he did. And I want us to recognize that Jesus is the source of our salvation. Satan had one goal. And his goal after going about and spreading all the distrust and the confusion and the hatred in the world is he wants to meet you at the gates of hell. Come on down now, he said. Be part of my brotherhood. But because of that cross and the crucifixion and the Christ, the gates of hell will not prevail. He could have come down, but he didn't. Ain't you glad? Now let's look at the second cross. I call this one the cross of reception. You see the difference now? This is the cross of reception not the cross of rejection. And that second thief, if you've read the scripture, you know he did not even begin to doubt the authenticity of Jesus. Instead, he says something like this, don't you fear God? That thief understood that God was what controlled his future. He recognized that God was the judge. And the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And this old boy he just gets smarter every day. He's beginning to understand. He acknowledged that he was condemned because of his own actions, his own doings. But the first step in being saved is just recognizing that you need to be rescued, that you are a sinner. Confess your sins. Let's face it, I think we're a nation of crybabies. You may or may not agree with me, but I really do think we're a nation of crack babies. A whole lot of us cannot or will not even admit when we're wrong. We go about just shaking our heads. Oh, I'm a victim of circumstances. Oh, pity me. Look at me. But you know, when you go about acknowledging that your own actions cause a particular situation that you're in, when you get down to the nitty gritty and accept that fact that your sins are forgivable, and acknowledgeable, then we begin to recognize this because of the cross, the crucifixion, and the 
and in Christ. And once again, that's why I can stand here to tell you and tell you. So proudly that he could have come down, but he didn't. Ain't you glad? Hallelujah, I am so glad. And now that third cross, here's the one that connects. Oh, I think you're going to love this. This is the cross of redemption. We've been bought back. Maybe like a big old fire sale, I don't know, something like a big buyout. We owe it all to Jesus. He went about his work converting us from convicts to convicted, if you will. He derailed us from damnation to eternal salvation, brothers and sisters. And because of that cross and that crucifixion and the Christ, Romans 3, 24 tells us because of His grace we're justified. Don't have a lot of scripture today to share with you, but Romans 3, 24 reads, Yet God in His grace freely makes us right in His sight he did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty for our sins. Mmm, don't you love that? Now, for you scholars that want to know a little bit more about this, I will read off some scriptures that you might want to look up, and I'll read them kind of slowly if you want to make notes of them. And if not, I'll read them anyway. If you go into Ephesians, Chapter 1 and verse 7, that will tell us that we have all been free. It's a great segment there. Over in the book of Luke, chapter 7, verses 41 and 50, lets us know that we're now debt free. What did I say? Jesus paid our debt for us in full. Romans 5, 16 lets us know that Jesus is the one that got us out on parole. Think about that. Here we are, I think each day we're on parole. I bet there's not one of us here that don't sin every day in one way or one form or another. It's okay to go back to Jesus every day at the same time. You go back to Jesus. Such a forgiving Father. Ephesians 2, 13, 14 reveals that Jesus turned us from excluded to included. There, we're now part of the party. Come on down. If you take a note, Colossians 2.15 will let you know that Jesus gave us a stay of execution. And Galatians 3.13 tells how we have been acquitted. These all kind of follow one, one another along. They're a great story of what can transcend in our lives. And Colossians 1.14 lets us know that we've had a blood transfusion. But never done that. He could have come down, but he didn't make you glad. Amen. I'm so glad. Well, Jesus said in the Luke 23, 43, he said this, and I know you've heard these words before. Verily I say unto thee, today you will be with me in paradise. I think that's what he said to that thief that was hanging next to him. Am I right? Yeah, I think that's what he said. You will be with me in paradise. So why? Because he could have come down from the cross just to save himself. But he instead decided to stay up there to save all of us. And brothers and sisters, we've got to rejoice because of that cross of redemption. He could have come down. We're talking about the man out there that gave the sight back to the blind. Here's the man that could make the dumb to talk. He could even walk on water. How amazing was that? And what did we read also in the Bible? That he fed the multitude of people with just a couple of fishes and a few loaves of bread. And he fed, I don't know how many thousands of people. I know there's a number mentioned in the Bible. I'm not sure what it was. But I'm not sure that included all the families. So that number could be multiplied by two or three times over. He took care of it all. Jesus came to us from heaven here to earth to teach and to preach and to show the way. He went from the earth to the cross to pay off our debt, to save our souls, to reconnect us to God. And we know that would not be possible if He had come down, but He didn't. I'm going to stop.
stop right here as we share the valuable story. But also because I've got another story to share with you. And it truly will teach us a bit about God's grace and mercy. It's a bit lengthy. But it's worth it. So I want you to just settle back now and listen up. This is called the donut story. Anybody here ever heard the donut story before? That's great. I'll try to get through this. There was a certain professor of religion. His name was Dr. Christensen. He was a religious man who studied and taught at a small college in the western United States. Now, Dr. Christensen taught a required class in Christianity at this particular institution. Every student was required to take this course regardless of his or her major. And although the doctor tried hard to communicate the essence of the gospel, in his class he found that most of the students looked upon the class as nothing more than required drudgery. Despite his very best efforts, most students refused to take Christianity seriously. But this year the doctor, Dr. Christensen, had a very special student named Steve. Steve was only a freshman. But he was studying with the intent of going on to the seminary. Steve was very popular. He was well liked. He was an imposing physical specimen. In fact, he was already the starting center on the school's football team. And by far, he was the best student in that class. And one day, Dr. Christensen asked Steve to stay after class. He said, I'd like to talk with you. And after the class had been dismissed, Doctor said to Steve, he said, how many push-ups can you do? Steve said, I do about 200 every night. I could do 200 in a year, but here's a young man. 200. 200, that's pretty good, Steve. The doctor said, do you think you can do 300? I don't know, said Steve. I've never done 300 at one time. Well, do you think you could, asked the good doctor. Well, I could try, said Steve. Well, then can you do 300 sets, 300 in sets of 10, 10 at a time? You see, I have a class project, and I need you to do about 300 push-ups in sets of 10 for this to work. Can you do it? I need you to be able to do it. Steve said, well, I think, he said, well, I said yes, I can do that. And the doctor said, well, good. I need you to do this on Friday. Let me explain what I have in mind. Friday came and Steve got to class early. He sat down in the front of the room. And when class started, the professor pulled out a big old box of donuts. Now these were the normal kind of donuts that you're going to find. You're going to find that these were the big old fancy ones. You know what I'm talking about? Cream centers and frosted swirls and all that good stuff on them. Amazing donuts. Yeah. Friday, the last class of the day, they're going to get to have an early start on the weekend with a party right there in the class, Dr. Christensen's class. So Dr. Christensen went to the first girl in the first row and he said, Cynthia, would you like to have one of these donuts? And Cynthia said, yes, please. Dr. Christensen then turned to Steve and he said, Steve, would you please do 10 push-ups so that Cynthia can have a donut? Sure. Steve jumped down from his desk. He did 10 quick push-ups, returned to his desk, and Dr. Christensen put a donut on Cynthia's desk. And then went to Joe, the next person. He said, Joe, would you like a donut? And Joe said, yes. And the professor asked, Steve, would you do 10 push-ups so Joe could have a donut? Steve did 10 push-ups. Joe got a donut. And so when, you know, all down the first aisle, Steve did 10 push-ups for each person before he received a donut. And then the doctor, he continued down the second aisle until he came to Scott. Now here's old Scott, you know, he's a, on the basketball team. He's another one of those, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Anyway, good physical condition. He was popular. He never lacked for female companionship. 
And when the doctor asked him, he said, Steve, would you like to have a donut? Steve's reply was, yes, if I can do my own push-ups. The doctor said, no, Steve has to do them. Scott said, then I don't want one. The professor shrugged. Then he turned to Steve and he said, Steve, would you do 10 push-ups so Scott can have a donut that he doesn't want? And with perfect obedience, Steve started to do the push-ups. Scott yelled, hey, I said, I don't want one. And the doctor said sternly, he said, look here, this is my class. These are my desks. These are my donuts. Just leave it on the desk if you don't want it. And he put a donut down on Scott's desk. Now by this time, as you can imagine, Scott's beginning to perspire a little bit. Starting to slow down a little bit. Oftentimes he just stayed there on the floor between the sets because it took so much effort. And as Dr. Christensen started down the third row, many students were starting to get a little bit angry. The doctor came to Jenny. He said, Jenny, do you want a donut? And Jenny's answer was a very firm no. But the doctor turned to Steve and he said, Steve, would you do 10 more push-ups so Jenny could have a donut that she doesn't want? Steve did 10. Jenny got a donut. By now, there's just a growing sense of unease filling up the room. And the students are starting to say no. And there was all these uneaten donuts laying there on the various desks. Steve, by this time, was having to do a whole lot of extra effort to get those push-ups done. A big old pool of sweat was on the floor beneath him. He's beginning to turn red because of the physical effort that he had to exert. At this point in time, you know, the doctor Christensen, he couldn't even bear to look anymore. All that hard work, all those unique donuts. So he asked Robert. Robert's the most social unbeliever in the class. He said, you watch Steve to make sure he does the, the push-ups, make sure he does 10 in every set. And now the professor, he started down that fourth row. And he noticed there's some other students start to come in, wandering in, sit down on the steps along the radius, out beside the wall there, ran down the sides, and he did a quick count. He saw now there's 34 students in the room began to worry about Steve. Would he be able to make it? He went to the next person and the next and the next. And near the end of the row, Steve was really having a hard time, taking a lot of time to complete each set. But this, then, just then, Jason, who was a recent transfer, he came into the room and he was about to enter. When all of us, all the students yelled, No, don't come in! They didn't want him in there. Jason didn't know what was going on, but Steve picked up his head. He said, no, let him come in. Professor Christensen said, you realize that if Jason comes to you, comes in, you will have to do 10 push-ups for him? Yes, let him come in, give him a donut. Dr. Christensen said, okay, Steve, I'll let you get Jason's out of the way right now. Jason, do you want a donut? Not even knowing what was going on, Jason said, yeah, I'd like to have a donut. Steve, will you do 10 push-ups so Jason can have a donut? And Steve did 10, very slow, very labored push-ups. Jason was totally bewildered, but he was having a donut. Dr. Christensen finished the fourth row and he started with the visitors over there by the radiators. Steve's arms are just now shaking with each push-up in a struggle to lift him up, himself up against the force of gravity, and sweat is just dropping off him profusely. And there was no sound in the room except for his heavy breathing. And by this time, there was not a dry eye in that room. The very last two students in the room were two young women. They were both cheerleaders, well-liked, Dr. Christensen went over to Linda and said, asked ask her if he, she wanted a donut. And Linda said very sadly, no thank you. The professor quietly asked Steve, Steve, would you do 10 push-ups 
so that Linda can have a donut she doesn't want. Grunting from the effort, Steve did ten very slow push-ups for Linda. Then he turned to the last girl, Susan. Susan, do you want a donut? And Susan now got tears streaming down her face. She's witnessed what's happened. She's pleading, Dr. Christensen, why can't I help him? And Dr. Christensen had tears of his own. Streaming down his face, and he said, no, Steve has to do it alone. I have given him this task, and he's in charge of seeing that everybody has the opportunity for a donut, whether he or she wants it or not. And when I decided to have this party on the last day of class, I looked at my grade book. Steve was the only one of you all with a perfect grade. Everybody else here has failed a test or they missed a class or turned in some inferior work. Now Steve told me that in football practice, sometimes when a player messes up, he has to do some push-ups. And I told Steve that none of you could come to our party unless you paid the price by doing your push-ups. And he and I made a deal for your sake. So Steve, would you do 10 push-ups so Susan can have a donut? Steve very slowly finished his last push-up with the understanding that he had accomplished all that was required of him, having done now 350 push-ups. His arms buckled under him and he fell to the floor. Dr. Christensen then turned to the room and he said, and so it was that our Savior Jesus Christ pled to the Father and to thy hands I commend my spirit. With the understanding that he had accomplished all that was required of him, he yielded up his life for us. And like some of those in this room, many leave the gift on their desk. Uneven. Two students helped Steve up off the floor, put him in the seat. He was totally physically exhausted but wearing a thin smile. Well done, my good and faithful servant, said the professor. Not all sermons are preached in words. And turning to the class, the professor said, my wish is that you might understand and fully comprehend all the riches of grace and mercy that have been given to you through the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior. See, God spared not only His begotten Son, but He gave Him up for us and for the whole world, now and forever. Whether we choose to accept His gift, the price for our sins has been paid. Wouldn't it be foolish? Wouldn't it be ungrateful just to leave it laying on the desk? It's a pretty powerful story, don't you think? I think what this should do, folks, is that it should impress upon us the fact that he came from heaven to earth. Then from the earth he went to the cross. From the cross he went to the grave. But you know that reconnection notice was delivered with the resurrection of the source of reconciliation. None of this would have come to pass if it were not for the fact that he could have come down, but he didn't. Ain't you glad? Amen.